Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Inspired Action. The goal of this podcast is to not only leave you inspired in some shape or form, but more importantly, that you are left inspired to take some kind of action in your own life. Inspiration plus action are a very powerful combination. The Inspired Action podcast is brought to you by Stage Fright Management, which provides cost-effective social media solutions to grow your brand. Check them out at stagefrightmgmt.com. On today's Inspired Action podcast, I'm very excited to have a fellow countryman, Michael Beatty, as my guest. Michael is one of Northern Ireland's most prolific and consistent providers of quality television programs and documentary films. His films have won awards in the UK and Ireland and in international film festivals in New York, Chicago, Boston and Houston. He was recently responsible for the first ever authorised documentary on Van Morrison, with the full approval of the, and participation of the star and his feature documentary on Netflix, which is called That Vitamin Movie, which he also presents, has had one and a half million online views so far. His new seven part series called Live Longer, Feel Better is also available online and he is currently finishing another online film called Faith, Hope and Cancer, which is out in July. Enjoy. Yep, I think we're live, Michael. Um, Technology hasn't failed me this week, thank God. So thanks, thanks for so much for uh, coming on to the, my very first podcast. Um, it's I'm very much appreciated that you took the time out to um, jump on with me this morning. I know it's um, it's nine a.m. Is it with you back home? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just delighted to be here. I mean, there's a number of things. I it's really odd for me to be interviewed by someone because I'm the one normally asking the questions. Um, and this has only happened to me a few times in my life, but you know it's it's quite interesting. So who knows where it's going to go? But who knows where? I'm delighted you're doing this with me because since we had our first meeting, which you you, you can talk about, um, or meeting online, you never met in the flesh yet. Um, I've been watching your Facebook page and keeping an eye on you, and I really love what you're doing. Um, Thanks. All the stuff I see in your Facebook page about social media, about how to use your bio and Instagram, all these things. I mean, they're not directly hugely relevant to me, but I really enjoy it. Um, I just love the way you go for it. And that's what really intrigues me and excites me about you. You're, you're a man with a big vision. Oh, thanks, Michael. That's, I, I really appreciate that. Awesome. I try my best. Um, I'm more or less educating myself. Anything that I share is more or less, you know, I'm teaching myself and then think if others can benefit from it, I'll just share it too. Um, I, but yeah. I think sometimes that's the best way because, I mean, I am no expert in anything. I just kind of make television programs. Um, I tell people story. All I am is a storyteller. I'm like yeah. a modern person, but old-fashioned storyteller. And um, I go in as the innocent into these situations to try and learn what I can and get information. So I'm not an expert in anything, but I've had great opportunity to delve into lots of areas and learn lots of bits and pieces. You definitely have me. Um, so that probably brings me to how I came across you in the first place. So it's, it's quite a funny story. It's like inspired action is the name of this podcast, but you can't get more inspired action than what happened um, that night. I uh, contacted you actually, because it was, I was sitting with my girlfriend at the time on that sofa down there. And um, she had um, queued up this documentary called That Vitamin Movie on Netflix. So I was, she was studying nutrition at the time. So I sat down on the sofa and, uh, and the movie starts. And then I hear this accent. And she said to me, is, he sounds a bit like you. Is, do you know this guy? Or is he from Northern Ireland? I says, hold on, I'll check here. So I just Googled That Vitamin Movie. I... Um, straight into um i found you on facebook i then just added you on facebook and you accepted me this is all within five minutes of the the documentary starting and um the funny thing was because i've been working as i told you that time i've been working uh on a documentary idea so i was like looking for someone like yourself to actually bounce a few ideas off so i remember sitting on the sofa and i just messaged you i just says um a, um, a fellow Irish man and uh, we just sat down to watch that vitamin movie on Netflix and I heard your accent blah 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 um, I'd love to maybe pick your brain sometime about um, a documentary idea that I've got and you were like 
no problem. Are you free now? And I was like, oh, my God, is this, this man serious? So uh, my girlfriend at the time, she couldn't believe. She was just in awe. She was watching you on the TV. And the next thing I just come up to this table, opened up a laptop, and we had a Skype for, I think, about an hour. And we had a, we had a great chat. <laughs> and, um, yeah, we just connected. We just hit it off then. And I told you about the documentary idea. You loved it, and you were, like, really busy. Uh, working on um, documentaries with the BBC and stuff. So, and then, yeah, that was probably a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. And, um, yeah, we've just kept in touch ever since. So, yeah, that, that Vitamin movie was really, really interesting. Um, it's just, I suppose it's one of those documentaries that you just, you just didn't know, like, any of that information existed. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how you actually came to um, record that documentary or get involved with it? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I just love stories. And I'll tell you one story first. As you know, I, I was in Perth uh, visiting my kids and grandkids for 10 weeks yeah. there. And it was the funniest thing. You just reminded me of it, talking about kind of seeing me and them putting two and two together. Um I was camping with my son down at Pemberton, you know, in the middle of a huge forest. We were in a little campsite. He and his wife had their tent up. I was having my first night in a swag. I'd never right. camped in a swag, <laughs> which for anybody outside of Australia who sees this, it's like the Australian equivalent of what we would call a, a bivy bag kind of thing. Um, so I'm putting up my tent. Uh, Chris is putting up his stuff. And out of the blue, this car pulls up and I get looked over and like this is the middle of nowhere in a you know in a forest. Um it wasn't like a wolf creek kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, this four wheel drive pulls up and two couples get out. Older than me, you know, they just nice people smiling and just started to wander over. And they were just interested. Uh, they had camped there years before they were staying um in town somewhere and they just come out for a look -see. so we get talking to them i'm kind of putting up the swag and my daughter-in-law then said michael michael come over she had been chatting to them and she'd overheard one of the wives say to one of the husbands that guy over there he's really like that guy we we're watching in that live longer feel better online series and my daughter-in-law said yeah that's him but like in the, a forest and the bowels of Perth, uh, you know, or Western Australia, and it's somebody who, who had seen me online. I just, that really tickled me. Small and I had, world. <laughs> had a great, great conversation with this woman because she was actually going through cancer treatment uh, herself. So uh, I haven't actually emailed her since. I need, to, I need to see how she's doing. So, I mean, my life, as you know, has been making documentaries. Um, way back, I was a reporter uh, for BBC and ITV during the worst of the troubles. Uh, then I became head of news in Ulster Television, as you know, um, and ran the newsroom. And I mean, that was a grim time. Uh, there was actually yeah. one occasion in 1972, I think it was a period when I was covering on average more than two murders a day. Wow. Uh, and I mean, I was a real news hound. There was nothing happened. I didn't know about it. I was working 24 hours a day or, or aware 24 hours a day and always yeah. listening. And I've kind of been thinking about that lately because there's so much negativity associated with all of that. And since I kind of backed off that, I've been able to extract myself from the whole news thing. Uh, I'm no longer a news hound. I don't even watch news every day. And for the stage I'm at, I find that beneficial. You know, oh, I don't exactly. need all that negativity. I'm grabbing life as hard as I can to do exciting forward things. And I think it's true, and some of the experts we've talked to have talked about how, you know, the media can influence, influence us negatively. I flip and love it. I've had a fantastic life in it. But I'm very well aware how negative it can be if you focus on certain things. However, yeah. Uh, there's bad news and there's good news, isn't there? Yeah, and there is plenty of good news if you find it, but unfortunately a lot of people seem to just get oppressed by the negative. Yeah. So Trevor King, friend of mine for 30 years or something, um, 
he was a music promoter. He's done many, many things in his life, kind of self-made, an entrepreneur, runs a variety of businesses. But he called me and he was busting to see me. We hadn't seen each other for a while. Uh, so we arranged to meet and he wouldn't tell me what it was about. So I'm thinking, you know, is he getting divorced? Has he got cancer? What, what, you know, it was like, there's big news he wants to tell me. So whenever I met him, it was great because Trevor said, in three weeks, he had got rid of a lifetime of depression. Now, Trevor's one of those guys who would be prepared to try every new therapy, uh, every new expert he would go for. You know, he, he he's open to anything and he would try anything. And he followed lifestyle coaches and all this. But nothing could, and some of the medication he took actually made him worse. Oh, of course. So he'd had all his adult life. Uh, he'd suffered from depression and at its worst I think he told me he was losing a week a month and wow. for a guy running his own business and several businesses that was really really tough so what had happened was in his never ending search for cures and things he had come across this guy in upstate New York called Andrew Saul and Trevor being Trevor um he, he found out where Andrew lived um, and he made an excuse. He told Andrew he happened to be in town, would there be any chance of meeting him? I think he emailed him first. Uh, of course, Trevor wasn't doing any business in town. He'd specifically gone there to see Andrew because Andrew promotes large doses. We call it mega doses now. We call him mega vitamin man. Yeah. He promotes large doses of vitamins to prevent and cure all sorts of stuff. So Trevor went to see him and he explained to Trevor that one of the key things he needed to do was first cut out sugar from his dad as far as he possibly could and then to take very large doses of niacin. Now, I can't remember what the RDA is, the recommended daily uh, amount of niacin is for all of us, but this is like hugely beyond that. I think it was five grams of niacin a day, yeah. along with a couple of other uh, small supplements and minerals. And Trevor said inside three days, he could feel the difference. Wow. And inside, inside three weeks, he was a new man. Uh, now, there's more to that story I'll come back to later. But Trevor, Trevor being Trevor, he said, people need to know this, people in Northern Ireland particularly, because you're probably aware that Northern Ireland has one of the highest suicide rates in Europe. Yeah, and yeah. as of last year, I found this statistic, we have the highest prescription rate uh, for antidepressants in Europe. So Trevor was just keen to, to get this information to people in Northern Ireland particularly. And he said, can't pay you, want you to do me a favour, we'll go and meet this guy and do a video. So it kind of grew from there. And when we went to see Andrew, Andrew opened the door on this thing called orthomolecular medicine, nutritional medicine, the right amount at the right time and all that. I had never heard of this. Now, I can't be expected to know everything, but, <laughs> you know, I know a lot of bits about a lot of different things. But I was staggered that I had never come across this before. Um, so what was to be a wee five or ten minute interview with Andrew started to grow. Um, and we decided we needed to do half an hour with Andrew. But then he said, oh, you've got to go and see this guy. You've got to go and see Joe Mercoli. You've got to go and see whoever. So it then grew. We decided we were going to do an hour. And ultimately, it turned out 90 minutes. We'd, uh, we ended up having this 90-minute film, as you well know, with 23, I think, of the world's foremost people in nutritional medicine, vitamins, how we need to take supplements to benefit us all. So that was really the background. Uh, it all came from Trevor suffering from depression and having this radical turnaround. Now, the other bit of the story I have to tell you is it didn't really last. Um, Trevor's still in much better shape than he was years ago, but he knows himself. He is one of the most hardworking men I know. He works all the time. 
he doesn't do the things that I keep telling him to do that I do. Yeah. I don't think he gets enough exercise. I don't think he gets enough fresh air. Sometimes his diet slips because he's traveling a lot. So he knows that himself. But more recently, he's kind of come back uh, to much better health. And I think I'll save that for, um, uh, no, maybe I won't. No, I, was thinking, I, I, I might bring that into the new film, which I know you want me to talk about later, uh, Faith, Hope and Cancer, because there's a kind of a Zen element uh, that mm. Trevor has recently found hugely beneficial. So, Brilliant. I mean, he's like me. We're just wee boys exploring this world and trying to learn as much as we can to benefit ourselves and then share this with anybody who's interested. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, I can't recommend that documentary highly enough. It's on Netflix, isn't it? Still, um, yeah. or Michael, um, isn't it? On Amazon, and we still. If people watch the website, um, thatvitaminmovie.com. dot com. I love yeah. the title. We we couldn't agree on the title, but we reckon <laughs> people would remember. Oh, Michael was talking about that vitamin movie thing. Oh, <laughs> Keep it simple. <laughs> yeah. So if people go to the website. They can sign in, and then we let you know the next time we're bumping it out for free. Okay, um, yeah. Every now and again, because of course we want people to buy it because it's been a long time, kind of us recovering the costs because we funded this ourselves. Um, so you you know you, when you buy the DVD, you get forty five minutes of extra features, you get a booklet, all that kind of stuff. So yeah. great value. Um, awesome. Yeah, but Trevor, Trevor actually looks after most of the marketing side of things, and I don't think I told you this, but how we actually funded that was Trevor uh, put his own money in initially, but we did uh, some fundraising in Indiegogo, yeah, uh, which gave gave us a few grand. That was um, my next question, actually. How you were all funded? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, Trevor is a self taught internet marketing person. Uh, yeah. He's, Studied it long and hard. He's been, his backgrounds in all aspects of, of marketing. Um, yeah. So I really go by his judgment on what we do when. So we did the Indiegogo thing, which was more successful than I could ever have thought. Um, yeah, but, Indiegogo is a really good fundraising platform. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. I know there are, I know there are others, but Trevor reckoned that was the one for us. Yeah, it's a really good uh, one for doggos and stuff. But a very important thing was we got one benefactor. Um, who was in Turkey. Um, <laughs> and I can't remember quite, he, he just must have seen our, our, our Indiegogo thing or, or somehow found us on the internet. So uh, he was in a position to give us several thousand dollars. Um, so that was a huge help. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, basically we went ahead and made the film. We were already in the editing process before we started really to get much money in. Um, right. And then over time, it's paid for itself. Yeah. And we, we've decided that anything else that comes in, there's a little trickle coming in as people buy more. Yeah. We're going to put that money. We're not taking the money. That money's going into the next yeah. thing or another we invest thing. In it. So we're just, for the moment, going to keep doing this health thing. And I have yeah. to give huge credit to... Um, our cameraman and editor, Cy Kelly. Cy is an amazing character, and uh, he did a fabulous job in this. I mean, all my career making documentaries and being in news and stuff. I mean, years ago, I was using like a 60 grand camera. Uh, right. I mean, like if you're traveling to America, you had big silver cases with a heavy tripod and boxes of lights and everything. But it's wonderful being in this position now where, and this was the first time I'd done it, I've been looking forward to uh, shooting on DSLR. Never done that before. Yeah. Uh, all those bigger broadcast cameras, although they have scaled down. So Sai basically shot this entire thing on two DSLRs and uh, two GoPros. Um, and I mean, you've seen it. You know how rich it looks. Yeah, it's uh, really good. Really good. And that opening mm -hmm. sequence, uh, I have to tell you about that because you know what one of my passions is canoeing not white water yeah. i'm a very gentle canoeist and kayaker i love touring but i couldn't work out an opening for the film and Sai had this kind of like a vision of me paddling a canoe at dawn sunrise 
pink sky, pink reflected in the water, silence, mist hanging on the water as I paddle out to this island. I mean, it was a beautiful dream. And I said, si, we need tens of thousands to create that, you know, <laughs> get the smoke machines and everything. And it was getting close to the wire. And I just happened to notice one evening the weather forecast for the next day, because I always keep an eye on particularly wind, so I, I don't like strong wind when I'm out paddling. And I saw flat cam, mist, and, you know, I thought this could be it. So <laughs> I phoned Sly and I said, are you okay for 4 o'clock in the morning or 4.30, whatever it was? He said, yeah, because he's that kind of a guy. Um, I phoned uh, my uh, friend and Christine. Christine's a sound recordist. She does behind-the-scenes stuff on Game of Thrones. She's done all the major documentaries. Um, but she's actually now shooting. She doesn't shoot generally, but she shoots for me on the health the stuff we're doing. Yeah. So I got Christine out as well. She jumped out at it at short notice. And it all happened. It was just like magic. We went down to this little island I know, Coney Island, not the Coney Island Van Morrison sings about. That's another Coney Island in County Down. This one's on the border between um, Armagh and Tyrone. If you imagine Loch Ness, that big bit of water people might have seen in the middle of Northern Ireland, down in the bottom left, there's a tiny, tiny island where the Blackwater River flows into Loch Ness. And we got everything, almost like Sai had envisioned it. So it was yeah. just incredible. However, that's just to say he really went the extra mile. And Sai had never done anything of that extent before a 90 minute feature documentary, which he edited as well. So it was a remarkable job. And he came on board just to do it. And, you know, we could pay him when we paid him. And, you know, he, he wasn't pushing it. So it was really, really good. Everything conspired to work towards Perfect. a good film, you know. That's how the universe works, isn't it? At times just At unfold times, perfectly. Yeah. Um, so that brings me to, the, I suppose, that last time we spoke over a year ago, um, um, and you were working on, I think, Live Longer, Feel Better, the seven-part web series. Was, was that was that correct? Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, that's that's another strange thing. And by the way, I hope you haven't forgotten your documentary idea because I think no. that is really, really good. And somebody has to make it. If I don't make it with you, somebody needs to make it with you. No, we'll we'll keep that part. It's it's coming to fruition definitely because there's more stuff more stuff coming happening about that. So um, yeah, I'll definitely hit you up whenever you can squeeze me in. <laughs> yeah. So after interviewing these twenty odd experts in this natural health field. Like we realized how much more there is there. We got literally thousands of emails on the back of that vitamin movie. Um, I was going to say thousands of emails of, of appreciation and, and people who had benefited from it. There were, were one or two from people who were, you know, poo pooing and saying load of nonsense, but there were really only a handful out of literally thousands. Yeah, big time. So, so we knew there was an appetite for this, and particularly in America, but in Australia, in, in Great Britain, we, we found these other experts um, from Japan, from Sweden. Um, so we knew there had to be more we could do. So we thought we would do a lot of the questions we got were about, they were from more mature people wondering about older age, how to stay off illness, this kind of thing. Yeah. There's some incredible statistics. There's a great guy in London called Patrick Holford. Um, and we interviewed him. And he quoted a statistic, which I was only thinking of. I actually looked at it again the other day, uh, to do with ageing. And basically, our population is living longer, but we're not living healthier. Right. So there, there was a survey done, and Europe-wide, the average woman lives the last 10 years of her life unable to climb 10 steps. So that's 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 the prospect for me, not too far down the road, you know what I'm thinking, and, and my wife, Jackie, you know, um, are we gonna be like this? Um, and another frightening statistic, I only got this morning, there's a great, I mean, there's so many of these experts that people can look at, Mark Hyman, 
Um, he specializes in the brain and brain function and all that. He has a new statistic only this morning that 50% of people in America suffer at least one chronic disease. I mean, that is staggering. Wow. Um, Crazy, isn't it? Yeah, uh, and like 30% of the population of obese, one in six children of obese. I mean, we're heading to this disaster. Yeah, it's only getting worse. Uh, as, as one of our guys described it, uh, a tsunami of sickness that the health services aren't going to be able to cope with. Um, and unless you kind of start to think about this, you know, you just go through life, you, you, you know, you take your fast food, you live the way you live, you miss out on exercise pressure and all these things and clean water. So, I mean, I just want to help people focus on this. I'm at a stage now where I wish, boy, I wish I'd known all this earlier when I was younger. Uh, you know, I was never one for junk food. I've always exercised a bit, always liked to canoe a bit, always liked to cycle a bit. So, you know, I'm not an extreme example of, of a misspent life, but there certainly is a lot more that I could have done had I known. So yeah. we're thinking, yeah, we'll do um, a film about encouraging people that it's possible to live healthily in old age and that you can live longer and live, live stronger and live better. Yeah, uh, and I suppose we were influenced a bit by the fact that I, uh, I'm sure you've heard of the Blue Zones. National Geographic did this big worldwide study. They made a film. Uh, they reported on it in the magazine. There are five areas in the world where people naturally live longer and live healthily. Uh, there's uh, a mountainous place in Sicily. There's Okinawa, a fishing in Japan. Uh, uh -huh. <clears throat> there's one in America. In California, right. in Loma Linda. So they basically set out to, to look at why it is that these people uh, do much better than the rest of us. And I think it was five. I should have beefed up on this before I talked to you. Uh, but then it'll encourage people to look at the blue zones and find out for themselves. Anyway, there, there are roughly five, I think, commonalities. And that's what they're called, blue zones. What's the, <laughs> what's the reason they be called bl blue zones? You know, I can't remember that. I better look it up again myself. <laughs> oh, that's interesting, though. Blue zone, yeah. So uh, diet was a big one. Yeah. All the disparate communities living completely different lives are primarily vegetarian. Right. I know that's wrong. Not primarily vegetarian, but they eat a huge proportion of fruit and veg compared to what we do. Uh, right. They would have uh, much more plant-based diet. Yes, lots of them eat meat. They're not like vegan or vegetarian or anything like that, or pescatarian. Um, so diet was one thing, and that was key. Very healthy diet. Uh, second thing was exercise. I'm increasingly dropping the word exercise in favor of movement, because exercise can put some people off. But, you know, you can walk around the block, you can walk around the park, you can take a dog for a walk. It's movement. We're designed to be moving lots during the day. And I was thinking about it yesterday. I sat here for an hour and a half and thought, oh, no, I try and get up every hour from my computer when I'm editing or whatever. Um, that's important. Get up, yeah. walk around the house, go out in the garden, smell the air, and come back in again. Anyway, yeah. movement, another key thing. Um, you know, the, 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 the Sicily sheep farmers, they're climbing up and down mountains in Okinawa. Uh, they don't have a word for retirement. People right. just keep keep working until they drop. And <laughs> there's there's kind of a, a respect for maturity and old age that maybe we've lost sight of. Uh, you know, we're inclined to stick an old person into a care home, whatever. Um, there's much more family connection and older people living with uh, their offspring or right. in in close connection with, not necessarily. With. So that was another key thing. Yeah, Life, life purpose was a big one. Um, people feeling useful, feeling wanted, feeling they want to live, they've got stuff to do. Um, so that was another key one. So anyway, there's more in the Blue Zones we could talk. We could talk for an hour about that, but it's really worthwhile people looking into the Blue Zones and what National Geographic discovered. Um, so... 
Trevor and I thought we'd do one film, another 90-minute film, like uh, that Vitamin movie. And we'd interview some of the same experts we talked to earlier and some other people we'd come across. But, you know, it was the same kind of thing again. You go through this door and there's so much there. And then Trevor says, you know, I think we need to do seven one hours. And I said, hold hold on, Trevor. You know, we've got the ingredients to make an apple pie. And you now want to make seven mince pies. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's a great analogy <laughs> that's quite stressful to me you know, I'm working towards one thing but my colleague says no 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 we need this other thing um, so basically we did some more interviews and we ultimately went for these uh, seven episodes every episode is completely different in style and, uh, and content um, I should have made a list did I make a list of the subject topics because I can't remember them all so, Michael, did you interview then people like, say, just your people from the Blue Zones um, as well as um, like health professionals or did you just interview? Oh, cool. So you interviewed both? Yeah, well, well we interviewed a whole range of people um, across all sorts of disciplines because, you know, obviously we had focused on vitamins and supplements in that first film, but that opened the door to so many other things. And we're meeting these other people who are saying, you know, you can take all the vitamins you want, but there are five or six other things you really need to be doing if you want to live a long and healthy life. Right. So, I mean, some of it too was based on the questions we got from people after that vitamin movie and the comments people made. So I'll just run over the, the titles of the seven episodes. Yeah, the sure. first, one was, for the first one was called The Golden 100. And that expression came from a guy called Ron Hunninghacky. And Ron runs the Reardon Clinic in Wichita, Kansas. Now, the Reardon Clinic, for like 40 years, has been treating cancer patients with vitamin C, some of which we, we, we looked at in that vitamin movie. I mean, mega doses, huge doses of vitamin C intravenously. And vitamin C kills cancer. Uh, you know, in a petri dish, it'll kill cancer cells. But it's the amount of vitamin C we need in our system to work against cancer. Again, I'm no expert in this. What I what I like to think of is, you know, people follow me in to meet these experts. Yeah. I interview the experts. I get what I can from them. And then it's up to people to either decide Make themselves. It. I'm not telling people to take this. I'm saying yeah, you're the middle man. here's a guy who believes this. Yeah, um, you're providing information. You know, yeah, take it uh, as you will. So the Golden 100 was basically little clips of everybody throughout the seven series, all of them believing that it's possible now for just about any of us, if we take the right steps, to live happily and healthily through our 90s and even to, as Ron said, a Golden 100 and beyond. Um, you know, I met some people who believe they're going to live to 160. Uh, wow. so, some of the guys are they on drugs what kind of drugs were they on or <laughs> <laughs> well they basically believe primarily um, everything that's available to us now that we can do to help us live uh, healthily but also technology yeah stem cells which I'll come to in a minute because that was where I met Mel Gibson as you know uh, because he has a fabulous story about stem yeah. cells Father. So, so also they believe they, some of these guys believe the technology is van, advancing so fast that if they set themselves up now doing all the right things, they'll still be okay when they're eighty or ninety, and then technology is going to help them to live yeah. even longer. Uh, and it's interesting, some guys. I always thought the Bible said, you know, you have your three score and ten. People talk about the three score and ten, but apparently God changed that. The, uh, after Genesis or later in Genesis. And um, a lot of people take a verse in the Bible about living to 120. So right. there are some, some of the uh, uh, nutritionists and therapists and people we met uh, are very firm Christians and they believe that God wants us to live to 120 and they're fully expecting to live to 120. Anyway, right. so that was episode one's a little bit of everything. Episode two 
like so much, I, I could say this staggered me, but so much in this has staggered me that I never knew because I never thought about it. Uh, it's called Why We're Toxic. And it's basically looking at all the different areas that influence our bodies that we don't really think about. Maybe sometime you think about walking through town and you, you can smell the exhaust fumes yeah, from the pollution. cars. Not very pleasant. But, you know, there's fire retardant in the carpet, in the settee, in a hotel room. You've got gunk all, all around your bed. You've got, you know, there are so many additives in so many ways. The stuff we're taking into our bodies, the stuff we're breathing in. Um, met this fabulous guy in uh, Tijuana, Mexico, um, Gaston Cornu Labat. Great name. He's about six foot five and he rides a motorbike and he is the man. You don't well um, remember that name. And, and he has talked about um, the degree to which cancer is clearly related to, in many cases, environmental toxicity, the stuff that we're taking in. And we need to think about all these areas. Another key one that I've never thought about before was a mobile phone. Uh, you know, in your breast pocket. Lots of women have kept it in their bra. Apparently, that was a thing to do in America until women started getting breast cancer. And if you read the small print in the iPhone contract, I don't know about others, it says, um, do not put this next to your body. Do not hold this phone more than so many centimeters to your head. So I don't know the degree to, to which this might influence us, but I'm not taking the risk. I know yeah, use yeah. I now use headphones or I put it on speakerphone. I avoid sticking it up to my head. So it gets warm, um, too. Yes, yeah. Deck phones. You know those uh, phones you have, one in the bedroom, one in the kitchen, they're all linked up. Those deck phone phones apparently are highly toxic. Right. Um, okay. So there's just so many areas where there's toxicity that we don't really think about. Um, next one was celebrating nutrition basically looking at diet, all the good things about diet, how we can eat healthily. Um, there's lots of advice there. And I suppose at the end, I'll just recap on what I think I have learned are some of the absolutely key things. But nutrition is obviously a huge one. Now, water, which we call troubled water. Um, Philip Day, who, who works out of London, but spends a lot of time in Australia, he talked about loving Australia because he loves Australian women. Uh, some of the nicest women he's met in the world. But he says, if you notice, so many of them have bad teeth. And that's because that's because of additives put in the water in Australia, according to him. Um, so when I was in Perth, I was looking at all these women to see what their teeth were. <laughs> You're not tapping them in the mouth. <laughs> um, so, you know, You've heard all your life, your body is 70% water. Yeah. I've never, I've never given that any thought. But it's not H2O slopping around inside you. There's fantastic new research that has shown what people have been trying to work out for a century, maybe, uh, a fourth stage of water. I mean, water exists as liquid, solid and ice, and vapor, clouds, yep. steam, stuff like that. But people believe for a long time there must be another form of water, and they've now discovered it. All right. Um, Four-stage water, there are different names for it. But basically what your body does with the H2O is your body converts it into um, H2O, H3O2. Right. So it's, and it's gel water. It's like the texture of um, an egg white. Okay. And that's that's the water that your cells need that fills your body. Okay. So if you're not able to convert enough H2O to H3O2, your body is not working as well as it should. It's not being optimal. <coughs> Excuse me. I get excited about this. <coughs> that was interesting. So, but we need sunshine. That's one of the things we need to convert. Vitamin D. Yeah. We need all that to convert the water to gel water. 
And I mean, this is really fascinating new stuff. Uh, met a great woman. Gerald Pollock was, is a professor in, in Seattle. I get to go to all these places and meet these fantastic, Brilliant. incredible. Now, he was like, well, I suppose I'm a grander myself, but he was a bit like an old grander, not quite a nutty professor, but a wee bit of that with him. And he's very, very funny as well. But he's written a huge book about this. Uh, he calls it Easy Water, in the American way, EZ, which okay. comes, from, comes from an exclusion zone kind of experiment they do. So it's Easy Water. Um, and Easy Water exists naturally in certain places, like maybe a remote waterfall or that kind of thing. Anyway, people need to know about water. Yeah. Now, since meeting these guys, I've gone off this notion. I still keep my water that I sip okay. on throughout the day. But, you know, you've heard this thing, we're supposed to take like eight big glasses of water a day or something. Yeah. Well, fabulous woman called Gina Bria uh, in New York. She runs an outfit called the Hydration Foundation and works with Gerald Pollock. Um, she studied ancient societies and she's an anthropologist actually by uh, profession. And she said, like these people survived and thrived in the jungle and the desert. They weren't going around with, you know, their bottles of water. Um, <laughs> and she says that we can actually drink too much water and it can dehydrate us. Actually drinking too much water can dehydrate us because if we drink too much, it's just flushing all the good stuff out of our systems. Right. Along the yeah. And she maintains that we should be thinking about hydration rather than liquid intake. Because okay. if we're doing the thing that they all say, we need to have a plant-based diet, we're getting lots of hydration through the food. Yeah, through and, the plants, yeah. And, I mean, Gerald makes a point. Now, let me remember if I can get this right. <sighs> that, you know, people swear by juicing. They'll take 20 carrots or whatever it may be, squeeze it all out, uh, throw away the fibre and just drink the juice. Now, I think juice has its place, particularly in treatment of cancer, but I prefer to use my nutri bullet type thing where yep. I can mash up my carrots, my celery, my apple, or whatever, and I'm getting the fibre as well in a yeah. smoothie. Yep, I'm the same, yep. But Gerald's, Gerald's kind of saying, maybe it's the case that we're extracting the juice from the fruit which is full of easy water. Oh, and yeah. it's actually the easy water in the fruit juice that's benefiting us. It's not necessarily other things. Vitamins it and might, stuff. It? Yeah, it might just be the easy water, or at least the easy water plays a big part in it. So Have they done much research into that, Michael? Uh, I haven't. I talked to these guys, but he is yeah. the expert. He's got the big fat book. Um Basically, I mean, I'm giving people a taster. Yeah. It's a taster for me. I mean, part of me wants to. My wife retired three years ago and so as a teacher, primary school teacher, and she wants me to retire. Right. The only reason I want to ease off my workload is to get the time to learn more about all these things. There's so <laughs> many things that I want to find out more about. Um, you know, I've had, a, I've had a really interesting spiritual journey. I want to find out more about that. And, I mean, water is one of the biggies because I don't really understand. And I've started to read Gerald's book, but then, you know, work gets in the way and that's always an issue to get the time to devote uh, to it. Anyway, so the whole water thing's a mega one. Then another episode was called Unlocking Our Cells. And the key part of this is the stem cell therapy. Right. Uh, uh, we haven't been going that long, have we? <laughs> Keep going. That's all good. Uh, stem cells were brilliant. Uh, in the vitamin movie, we met Neil Reardon, um, the son of one of the earlier early pioneers um, in vitamin C treatment for cancer, hence the Reardon Clinic in Wichita. That was his father. But he worked with his father, was key in the development of vitamin C for treating cancer. But, I mean, he is one sharp dude. He has created lots of patents. He has taken the orthomolecular medicine thing on uh, into stem cells. 
Now, there was a controversy about stem cells years ago and where they come from and everything else. That really has gone, but it's still a hangover for people of my age. I don't know if you came across it. But it was stem cells and embryos and aborted babies. Yeah, it was a bit of a dodgy, a dodgy deal going down years ago. Basically, the most potent stem cells are in newborns. When we are born, we've got we're stacked full of them. But as we go through life, they just diminish and diminish and diminish naturally, and that's part of the reason why we die. Because the stem cells are the ones that heal us, fix us up. If we get a cut, kid gets a cut, it'll heal like that. If I get a cut now, it takes longer to heal up and everything else in the rest of your body. Yeah. So stem cells are key. So, I mean, there are lots of people doing this, but Neil um, is just a hugely, hugely impressive man. And the fact that he gets people like Mel Gibson uh, going to him is testament to that. So I'll come to Mel Gibson's story in a moment. But um, Neil gets his stem cells officially, legally above board from the umbilical cords of cesarean birth babies. So, I mean, this is stuff that would otherwise be thrown in the incinerator. And so, it only happens in Mexico, is that right, Michael? Um, well, it's legal to, or legal to play it's, with. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's becoming so much more important that Texas has now allowed it. Texas is his, uh, the state where he lives. He has been working at it in Texas. Actually, some people in legislation in Texas have had family members benefit from stem cell. Oh, treatment. that'll work then so better. Now being permitted in certain circumstances in Texas. But Neil's been doing it for quite a few years, as have others, uh, in Panama. Um, and Panama's fabulous. It's the nuttiest, craziest place I've ever been. <laughs> I mean, I've driven in Bosnia, and that was weird. <laughs> There's no rules of the road uh, in Panama. Um, I digress, but I have to tell you that she love this. Uh, <laughs> there, there's no sat nav for Panama. Uh, right. there, there are precious few maps. I got a tourist map and eventually found my way to the hotel. Um, oh, Google uh, works to a degree. Um, but I noticed the, the street I'm staying in was... Uh, I've forgotten his name. Anyway, it was, let, let's say, Fernandez Samuel Boyd. And I thought, that's really weird. How does somebody have a good Northern Ireland name like Samuel Boyd, but also be called Fernandez? <laughs> uh, and he's got a street named after him. So I researched it a bit. And there might be a film here, because I think <laughs> he, was, he was the son or grandson of the original Samuel Boyd, who left Fermanagh and ended up in Panama, um, the family between them, the three generations, founded the, the main newspaper in Panama, were instrumental in the creation of the Panama Canal, were involved in politics, and uh, one of them was the first president of Panama. Wow. Oh, oh, from Fermanagh. Anyway. <laughs> I think, yes. So Neil takes this, this stem cells and, and kind of breeds them in the lab. So they multiply like mad, you know, it's possible for me, say, if I'm ill, under the right circumstances, I don't know about the health service here, but I gather it can be done, for my stem cells to be extracted, multiplied in the lab, and then pumped back into me. In right. fact, I have a friend um, um, who's benefited from that. Right. But as, as Neil said, those cells from a guy who's 60 multiply so slowly. When you have newborn cells, they just go like mad. So you can get thousands and thousands, millions of these things. Right. So uh, you pump them in and they start to do that job of healing the system. And he describes what happens. He said they kind of race through your system and it's almost like, almost like they'll come across a stem cell that's on its last legs and they'll let it go. But if they come across one of your stem cells that's flagging a wee bit, they kind of give them a nudge and say, come on, come on, come on. And they keep life in that stem cell, which would otherwise die. Wow. It creates a lovely picture. But anyway, Mel Gibson's father uh, at 91, I think it was, no. Can't remember the details now. Yeah. Um, he was on his last legs. He was in the Mayo Clinic. They'd given him a couple of weeks to live. Uh, his 
heart was weak, he had chest problems, emphysema, and who knows what. He needed two uh, new knees. He had muscle problems. Uh, Mayo Clinic had done everything they could for him uh, and come to the end of the line. Mel's brother had heard about this, uh, about Neil's clinic. So they got the old boy down and they gave him two sessions of stem cell injections. Maybe it was 92, 91 or 92. Um, yeah, I think it was around that. On his next birthday, he's dancing. He had two carers and he's pushing one of them in the wheelchair. <laughs> Him in. So this was just miraculous. So Mel has had uh, stem cell injections himself for a shoulder injury. His father's yeah, been yeah. Down, his father's been down several times since, and now at ninety nine, is still going strong. Yeah, because it's interesting. I watched the um, Joe Rogan podcast there oh, yes, yeah. before yeah. Christmas. Mel was on it. Yeah, yeah, and it was just fascinating. Yeah, fascinating, and. You know, they've, there's just about, I, I don't know if there's anything you can do with autism. Um, there doesn't seem to be any kind of successful treatment. It's learning how to live with it and developing. Um, but they have had instances, and Mel Gibson said he's seen these with his own eyes, where a child talked for the first time. Um, uh-huh. One of the staff was close to tears when she told me, you know, I love working here because you see miracles. And she saw this kid who said mom for the first time. Um, so they reckon they have about a 30% significant uh, improvement in children with autism. Um, so, I mean, that's just staggering. Um, the best story, um, the most dramatic story, was a, a pilot from South America who'd broken his back in a plane crash and was paralyzed from the chest down. They gave him stem cell treatments uh, over a period of weeks. After the first one, he started to feel his toes. After the second one, he could feel his legs properly. And after three treatments, he was struggling to get up. That guy has since resat his pilot's license. This is unheard of. Never before in history has anyone with that degree of spinal injury ever recovered. And the oh, one thing that the one thing that definitely goes when you have that injury is your sexual potency. He's now father of twin daughters. Right. I mean, there are, it doesn't work in every case, Neil says that himself, and sometimes they don't know why it works and why it doesn't work, but there are so many dramatic cases. Um, I didn't meet the guy myself, but I saw the video, a guy who came in with advanced Parkinson's, and he it showed a video of him trying to shave, and, you know, it's like that. After one stem cell treatment, in 45 minutes, he was flipping the dime and catching it behind his back. Wow. <laughs> so, so when do you think this is ever going to get mainstream? How long do you think, how far away do you think we are? Uh, Neil said he's been bowled over at, what is it, the exponential growth or possibility of that. There's so many people doing it now. There's so many people interested in it. The more people who do it, the cheaper it gets. Um, oh. You're talking about uh, 20 grand, 25 grand, I think, dollars uh, for a basic treatment. I think that's it. Um, but he said it'll it'll soon be like, you know, replacing the tires on your car or something. You'll just go and do it as a matter of course. So he's hopeful that's not too many years. Uh, distant. So next episode was living with cancer because it's still a thing that people come back to again and again. Very different episode f- focused on three people. My mate Brian Houston, musician from, from Belfast, um, and his wife Pauline. Pauline had breast cancer, so it was really their story. A guy called Chris Wark, who's very prominent uh, online, Chris Beat Cancer uh, is his website, and he has an incredible story. And then a lovely guy that Trevor and I have read, admired, respected for many years in New Mexico, Richard Rohr. He's a Catholic, a Franciscan theologian. Um, with a huge following um, and a very wise man and very helpful to me in my spiritual journey. Um, just gives insights and understandings that I haven't found anywhere else. 
remarkable guy who himself had cancer. Um, and that kind of leads on to your divine dance, which was much more about the spiritual side and focused more heavily uh, with Richard Rohr and others. Cool. So, so we do this series. Um, we're still... So where, can, where can people uh, access that at the minute, Michael? Because I live haven't long, had a chance to watch live it long, yet. But... LiveLongerFeelBetter.com, sign in, and uh, you can buy it, or you can wait until we bump it out free, but it's hard for everybody to catch all seven episodes. Uh, yeah. You can buy it or leave your name, and we'll keep in touch and let you know when it's next. Coming cool, out free. so LiveLongerFeelBetter.com. LiveLongerFeelBetter.com. Cool. Uh, I reckon that that last episode, Your Divine Dance, Trevor and I talked about this a lot, you know, should we focus one whole episode on the spiritual dimension or whatever? You know, I don't think everybody's going to be interested in that. Uh, I think all those other things are going to appeal more. Maybe we should make it six or whatever. I was blown away by the interest in Your Divine Dance. So putting a number of things together, that included, uh, that's why our next one that I'm editing right now, um, I was at it earlier this morning and will be when we finish here, um, Faith, Hope and Cancer. Um, because cancer is still the biggie that everybody asks us about. Um, cancer is the big fear. I mean, you mentioned your sister. Um, my sister uh, died in 2007 from colon cancer. And it yeah. was only... Only months from start to finish. Uh, she was 57, led an exemplary life, was looking for a single woman, looking forward to retirement, early retirement, and she never got to see it. Yeah. And there's cancer in my family, so that kind of makes me... Yeah, <laughs> it does. Like it's it's and, very... And, like, and Alzheimer's. It's, yeah, it's, uh, thankfully my sister um, is still alive. Um, she, she contracted lymphoma whenever she was around 30. Um, and she went through chemo and beat it. But whenever I say beat it, it's still, it's just dormant, you know, so she has to get bloods, you know, taken every three months to see if it's, and it's yeah. just like, it, it's just a, an awful stressful, stressful time for every three months. And it, yeah. like she definitely does um, live her life a lot, you know, bigger and better. She travels now and doesn't, you know, like say yeah. no to things, but um, yeah, it must be a really, really scary thing for people. And it's, yeah. it's, it's but yeah. The good news is, all these experts, and we're not talking about quacks. You know, some of the guys, uh, a very small number of the guys uh, we've been meeting don't have a medical qualification. Andrew Saul, the mega vitamin man, he doesn't have a medical qualification. He's a doctor of philosophy or something, and he's been a teacher um, and a nutritionist and various other things. But these guys are experts. The guys we're talking to in Panama, um, Hope for Cancer is a clinic run by a Christian husband and wife um, who firmly believe God led them to create that clinic. And and we talk, we were only able to talk to a couple of patients. There were only two there for the, we only had a couple of days. But they firmly believe that this clinic and their attitude saved their lives. Now, before we went to Panama, uh, I Googled, uh, or not Panama, Mexico, Tijuana, I Googled clinics to you, Anna, because there's dozens of them. Yeah, because legal. All kinds of alternatives that don't exist in America. And both the Guardian, I think it was the Guardian and, and the Times, well, big newspapers, both had articles about, uh, you know, the Tijuana ripoff, uh, the quacks who are fleecing people of money uh, for, no pretend, no, for no benefit. And I'm sure those guys are there, but... No, oh, you've got shakers everywhere. But... You know, the people I deal with, I've been around a lot of corners. It takes a lot to fool me. And they must be either the best con men in the world and con women, or I'm losing my touch. Um, I don't necessar necessarily accept everything every one of them tells me. I doubt some of it. But as this guy was telling me about, uh, Gaston Cornu, the bat, says, everybody's got a bit of the truth. What we he works in that clinic. What we try and do here is we give the patient everything. We throw everything at them, including the kitchen sink, you know, because 
there are so many variables, but they all agree only 5% of cancer is genetic. I thought it was all genetic. You know, if it's in your family, you're going to get it. There's, but, you know, it's the luck of the draw. But these guys are telling us there's no luck about it. If that 5% uh, are genetic, but we might have it in our genes, but we can change the expression of our genes. A guy called Robert Scott Bell says... Epigenetics. Yeah, we... We have to realize that unwittingly or not, we are co-creators of our cancer, of Massive. our death. Uh, but as co-creators, if we learn about it, we can be uncreators or creators of a different us. Yeah, you can have an influence on the positive. So um, face, hope and cancer has been pretty amazing. Um, there's a guy I came across years ago, tried to get him for a film or a long time ago, he's he's the boss of he was the abbot of um, probably the the best known Zen Buddhist center in America, San Francisco. He was sitting in my house the other day for an interview, and he's from Belfast. Paul Haller comes from Belfast, left in the seventies, traveled the world, ended up in Japan, found Buddhism, and so on. Um, but he's very firmly of that view that you know we have to create our own reality. Yeah. Um, so like, it's just amazing. The whole, the I whole it. it's an adventure. Yeah. Um, and we're now looking at possibly another film further down the road, which yeah. is going to be maybe about hydrogen water. You can now get, I mean, there's all sorts of water available now, Kangen water, different people, you know, claim all sorts of cures. But undoubtedly, more hydrogen in the water in a form your body can readily take it on board, absorb it. All viable. Is looking pretty good. So yeah. that could be a whole film. Awesome. So just on the epigenetics, there's a really good book um, I've read a couple of times called The Biology of Belief by right. um, Bruce Lipton. Um, he's got loads of YouTube videos as well, but it's, it's, it's exactly about what you said. It's like we influence our health by our thoughts, basically. Yeah. Um, and then there's another guy that I just mentioned to you before we went live, a Greg Braddon. Um, yeah. and he's, he's, um, a massive researcher into, he's, he's seen videos and shown videos of actual cancer tumors, like disappearing with these doctors holding hands, like having this like belief chant. And yeah. it's just actually disappearing and it's like phenomenal. It's, it's legit and it's real. Like a lot of people doubt it, but that's, that's their yeah. concern. But, um, I'm a massive believer in it. Um, I think, yeah, I think there's a lot going to come out in the future, um, about that and how our, our belief is that, you know, come, helps our biology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there's certainly a lot of that in, uh, this film. Um, so when's it due out, uh, Michael, Faith, Hope and Cancer? Quite soon, probably July. Oh, cool. Uh, and is it going to be online? Is it just one movie? Yeah, 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 I'll keep you particularly advised. See, one of the things, sometimes I think it would be lovely to get a television broadcast for these films. But the way the television system works, I mean, you look at that. The last film I did for BBC, which was broadcast while I was in Australia in February, um, was uh, told you about the story of a guy from Tyrone in 1822, kid who left Northern Ireland penniless, got into the fur trade in the Rocky Mountains, along with DiCaprio's character, Hugh Glass, the real life Hugh Glass. Uh, and the Revenant, from, isn't it, the Revenant, movie? Yeah. Um, epic story um, of the adventurous life he led, 10 years in the mountains, then he gets into business, he becomes the wealthiest man in Missouri. Um, there's a love story because a 33 falls for a 14 year old, but yeah, he had the, he had the, decency, well. <laughs> he had the decency to wait until she was 19. And then, <laughs> then tragedy uh, because they had 13, 13 children and 10 yeah. of them died before eight years old. There was just so much illness. St. Louis was just a wee hick border town. It was the end of the line before wilderness. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of disease and infection. Anyway, epic story. But you know, BBC commissioned that uh, a year and a half ago or something. But, you know, I put it to them before. It's uh, five years ago. It, it, you know, it can take that long to get something, to get a document. Yeah. 
broadcast. Not always, but often, I would say. Whereas yeah. with these films, we don't have to worry about a broadcaster. We don't have to worry about executive producers. And we don't have to worry about reshaping our idea to suit them. Because sometimes, you know, they like your basic idea, but they want you to tweak it. Yeah, here they and want to tweak it and stuff them to make them happy. What you wanted it to be. So it's much easier for us to put it online. And as you know, that, that vitamin movie has had way over a million, I haven't checked lately, a million views. Um, and, you know, it'll be there forever and, and more people are discovering it and putting out the word. So we're just hopeful that, um, well, Live Longer, Feel Better hasn't reached anything like that scale yet, but it will in due course. Oh, well, over time. And we're hoping that Faith, Hope and Cancer will. But again, I mean, I have met so many people with so many fantastic stories and teachings and understandings that this could be a two-hour film. You know, I, I'm, I just don't want to throw away yeah. any You don't want to cut it short either but, and just take it as it comes. But the advantage is, I mean, I'm, when we put this online, I'm going to make sure you get it, uh, particularly that interview with Gaston Cornu-Labat, um, incredibly impressive guy. And he takes a view that as a doctor, and he believes all doctors should be like this, the doctor should not be saying, that's wrong with you. Here's what you need. Um, we should not be handing over responsibility to the doctor because he said, we're all like blind men describing the elephant. Everybody's got a different bit. And, That's it. We're all different. And it takes all the bits and all the understanding to treat someone. And yeah. doctors, I mean, he's the most humble guy. He says, I'm merely a guide. You know, I've specialized in this. I've learned some stuff. I have experience. All I can do is maybe give you a bit of a map or, you know, help you along the way. But people get better when they understand it's down to them. They are co-creators of their health. Yeah, uh, totally. Just, you know, accepting some, what somebody else tells you. Um, it's just fascinating. Responsibility. Full on. You have to take 100% responsibility for everything that's going on in your life and everything that's not going on in your life, I think. Yeah, well, Michael, it's um, it's been an absolute pleasure um, Delight chat, to chatting to you. Um, I'm looking forward to yeah, I'll put this onto YouTube and I'll put it onto iTunes as well, um, awesome. and then share it around. Um, and I'll make sure and send you all the links and stuff. But yeah, so so the, that that movie. Have we, time, have we time for a parting shot? Yeah, just we do. In my mind, go for um, it. I just want to summarise a couple of the things that are key that anybody can do. I mean, this journey, I've learned some simple things. Well, as Andrew Saul says, it's simple, but it's not easy. But I'll give you the bits and learn more. Basically, we need to eat an 80% plant-based diet. If we can strive towards 80% plant-based, enjoy your pizza, enjoy your meat, even enjoy your liquor, because I do. But try and go for 80% plant-based. Plenty of water, but be cautious about overdoing it. Think about what other uh, hydration you're getting from the rest of your grub. When you're thirsty, you're already past the point where you kind of you should have had water an hour earlier. Older people uh, lose their thirst, uh, so it's easier for older people to dehydrate. So they need to be sipping, but don't panic about eight glasses a day. But hydration's key. Movement, get exercise, whatever it is. Ty Bollinger. Lovely guy did this epic series called The Truth About Cancer. Massive, massive online series, worth anybody's while looking at it. But he swears by, and I have one in the corner, had it for years, a rebounder, a little mini trampoline. He says oh, yeah. one of the best things any of us can do to help prevent cancer. Uh, wow. Our lymph system works on one way valves. By using a trampoline, you get the lymph system going, which takes away the impurities. Cleans it, yeah, cleans it. Tony Robbins is big on those. He jumps up and down on those before he goes on stage. I only heard that the other day. Uh, well, I actually used it for this morning. I overdid my garden work and painted the shed roof, resealed the shed roof on Saturday, and I twisted my hip or did something. So this morning, I couldn't go through my normal little stretch routine because it was too sore. But I could bounce on the trampoline for a wee warm-up and then jog. So I did 20 minutes, 25 minutes jogging and did the same thing yesterday and then cycled over to Queens and back over to the university area. Um, so it just loosens you up, makes you feel really good. So there are some of the key things. Um, think about your supplements. We all need vitamin C. Everybody needs to look at having vitamin C, vitamin D, 
somewhere like here where you don't have the sun sickness. <laughs> Definitely need it back home. And omega threes. So there are some of the dead simple things that yeah. we we can all do and do very easily. Yeah. And there's one there's one other thing I wanted to say because I kind of dreamt or imagined us having this conversation and I was thinking, what am I going to talk about? What am I going to say? And I've talked nonstop. Um, <laughs> but one of the key things in my well Take it back to Trevor put a post on Facebook the other day. I haven't asked him about it yet, but he said one of the disasters, one of the key problems and issues of modern society is separation between generations. Uh, you know, families losing touch with their children, their grandchildren, whatever. And I mean, I there are two guys close to me who have been denied access to their grandchildren because they kind of fell out with their sons, in both cases, sons. Um, and that's, I couldn't imagine life without my grandchildren. Um, you know, I spent so much time with them when I was in Australia. Can't wait to get back. And we're FaceTiming every day. Um, and, I, you know, I, I think more about that because in my own experience, that is increasingly true. Uh, you know, kids aren't talking to their parents. I, if anybody identifies this or if anybody feels that is the case, there was one thing I learned years ago. I mean, my kids inspire me. Uh, my eldest, who's 40 and living in Perth, um, you know, he he created a, a, a group of really good people and got them cycling again. So they're out doing, you know, 100K cycles. They actually did the three dams challenge recently. And, you know, that's that's really his motivation and inspiration has got these people out. They go camping and all sorts of stuff. I admire my daughter who, who has had the balls to, to move to Perth with three young kids, you know, and start a new life there. Uh, she's amazing. Um, my middle child, another son who's who's still living here, um, at 37, he has completely changed career because he wasn't fulfilled doing what he was doing. He's now found his niche and he's loving it. Good on him. So they, they inspire me. I can't imagine life without kind of close contact oh, with me. And the point I'm getting to is a little mantra. I looked at this recently, the power of mantras whether it's the Hail Mary, the Lord's Prayer, Om, whatever you might be uh, chanting or, or reciting. Um, there has been research to show that repetition of, you know, a phrase or a saying or whatever really benefits us. Um, a guy called Darrell Wolf says, you know, if we say something a thousand times, it gets into our subconscious or something like that. When my kids were small, I, I went to see this uh, Bible teacher, fabulous guy visiting from America, um, Jay Fesperman with his wife, Sally, Jay and Sally Fesperman. And they ran uh, basically a kid's home out in the desert for kids who were absolutely the pits, who um, were in all sorts of trouble for all sorts of reasons. Nobody else could deal with them. And they came to this place, which he called the Inn of the Last Resort. And he said, no, no, nobody could ever think about escaping because it's desert everywhere. But he said that the one thing everybody had ever, every kid he'd ever dealt with, the one common problem, the root of everything was love, that they felt unloved. Now, some of them were, some of them had been. Some of them were loved, but didn't realize it. Some of them even thought, they had been un the product of an unwanted pregnancy. And he, he he had a little mantra of some kind that he said that night. Uh, in fact, it was like a weekend of teaching about children and stuff. So I started to develop this little mantra, which I did with my kids. And I would encourage any parent to use it. I don't know, but I think it is maybe one of the reasons why Throughout life, through all the teenage years and all the angst and the problems, uh, my wife and I have always had a really good relationship with our kids. Um, so there are four things. And I told my kids this before they could even speak it. I gave them the answer. And then when they reached talking time, uh, they could give the answer. And my grandson, Toby, in Australia is two now. And I've made it into a song. And, you know, we'll sing the song together. How much do I love you more than anything in the world? When do I love you? All the time. When did I start loving you? When I was in mummy's tummy. When will I stop loving you? 
Never, ever, ever. So my kids have grown up with that ingrained and they're like, whatever they do, whatever mischief, yeah. whatever trouble there is, daddy and mommy are going to be here. We love you, whatever, whatever, whatever pans out in life, you know? So, I love it. Very, very powerful, Michael. I don't know, but if, if, if that's a help to anyone. No, it uh, definitely is. It's, it's massive. It's, um, it's, it's, it's like there's either love or fear, isn't there? And um, yeah. love, love's a stronger one. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. Uh, awesome, Michael. Legend. I'd Loved like, it. Very, very interesting. I'd like us to keep even more closely in touch, but I'll certainly keep you advised of the progress of things. Um, cool. I'll get the and full I'll, come, I'll come back to you with a treatment for, for my documentary <laughs> whenever the time's right. Okay. All right, Michael. Good man yourself. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I'll speak to you soon. Thank you very much indeed. Take care. Take it easy. Bye-bye.